you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. How can you boost your creativity and innovative potential? How much of a difference is there between simple knowledge transfer and hands-on approaches to education in the real world? What criteria do business professionals use to seek out educational experiences? Listen in today to hear the answers to these burning questions. My guest today is Justin Lucas Savage. Justin is an entrepreneur and internet marketing consultant. We asked Justin to discuss the entrepreneur's view of education, and some of his answers may surprise you. Hey, Innovation Nation. We want to recognize your excitement about the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. Leave us a five-star rating in iTunes, and we'll give you a shout-out here on the podcast. If you connect to us via email after leaving your feedback, you'll have a chance to get a special gift from us. Every week, we'll choose a special person to receive a $50 credit for the upcoming Inventors Bootcamp. To learn more about Inventors Bootcamp, visit www.ttinvent.com slash bootcamp. That's www.ttinvent.com slash b-o-o-t-c-a-m-p. And now, the moment you've been waiting for, the great inventor secret of the week. I know that many of you are interested in tabletop inventing because you want to learn how to become a great inventor. And so we've decided to add a little section here every week to help you understand that inventing is not a mysterious process. Inventing is actually something that most people can do. There are lots of very doable things that you can learn to become a great inventor. So here's this week's secret. One of the greatest enemies of innovation is stuck thinking. We get stuck in our thinking by doing the same things over and over again every day. We have the same routines every day, every week, every month. Without even realizing it, we've created traps for our creativity. This is not to say that routines are bad necessarily. Routines help us become more efficient at our daily tasks. Without routines, we might wander around in our actions trying new things all the time, but never accomplishing much. However, the opposite is also true. Without creativity and innovation, we might get lots of things done, but never get the right things done, or never do the things that truly matter. So let's consider the process of innovation for a few minutes and reflect on the relationship to routines. The mind is sort of like a field. It can be shaped and altered by actions, habits, and occasionally a significant paradigm shift. Thought patterns in our minds are like little grooves or trails or great big crevices in the brain. When a particular type of thinking begins, looking both ways before crossing the street for instance, it is weak and barely noticeable on the terrain of our young mind. Over time, if we persist in looking both ways before crossing the street, it becomes a natural routine that occurs to us as we approach any automobile thoroughfare. Eventually such habits become so ingrained in us that as our feet reach the curb, our head automatically turns one way and then the other in perfect timing. The thought, once only a scratch on the surface of our neurons, has become an indelible feature in the brain. Because habits so deeply affect the mind, it is important to consider the effects of routine on our thinking. Routines become the enemy of innovation when they create grooves in the mind so deep we can't seem to get out of that particular pattern. The habit trench behaves like this. As we approach the pattern in our brain, our thoughts are inescapably drawn toward the habit. Once the thoughts are quite close, they sort of stumble on the edge and fall down the side to the bottom of the trench and we are forced to walk along the bottom until we find a spot to climb back out again. It isn't difficult to see then that a mind ruled by habit 
has deep grooves running everywhere. We all know someone like this. They always have the right way to do things and always do things that way, never considering other possibilities. It is almost like they create a way to live as a teenager or a young 20-something and haven't lived anything new for 20 or 30 years. How do we avoid becoming like that? Or, if that describes us right now, how do we break the pattern and climb up out of the ditches we've created in our mind? This may sound silly, but the first step is to change some things that don't matter too much. Try taking a different route to work every day. Eat in a new restaurant every time you go out. Take a trip to somewhere you've never been. It can even be less than an hour away as long as you've never been there. When you see a road to the left and think, I wonder where that goes, check it out. Drive until it ends or takes you somewhere you've been before, but from a completely new direction. And one of my favorite activities to start innovative thinking? Read books about subjects you've never considered. Read biographies of great thinkers, innovators, and world changers. These little decisions will slowly start to renew the plasticity of thinking required for innovation. A neglected road in the mind begins to be reclaimed by the jungle of neurons and over time will fade into a dim memory. Simply by trying new things and having new experiences, the grooves in the mind will begin to fade. Some of those grooves may be useful and helpful, such as looking both ways before crossing the street, but others definitely need to change. So when you hop in your car tomorrow morning, intentionally change some aspect of the route you normally take. It doesn't need to take you twice as long. Just take the next street over. It may only take an extra minute or two to get where you are going. But in your mind, it will take you places you've never been. And now, our featured guest. Justin Lucas Savage coaches people to do business better by using the power of their personal stories. Justin graduated with a degree in aviation and immediately became a commercial pilot. Knowing it wasn't the story he wanted to live, he began coaching people to get out of debt. He grew his business so quickly, with the help of coaches and mentors, that other business owners took notice and asked for advice on doing the same. Justin is currently working with a handful of startups and nonprofits in marketing. So Justin, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, to build off of that bio a little bit, um, I still continue to, uh, to work and do some consulting and marketing and operations. Uh, and I mainly work um, with a, a couple of startups right now that I'm really close with. And the main one is a software company and I manage the uh, product iteration cycle for them. So as it relates to building the software, um, I look at it from a business perspective and figure out what to build and, and when it should release. So that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, people in uh, education may or may not be able to completely digest that, but uh, we'll just take that for what it is. Um, and but in as educators, we're very interested in the perspective of the industry that's receiving the end product, namely the uh, students that are graduating from schools. So, what is your perspective on the state of the union in education, so to speak? You know, I, I think. Um, that varies a lot depending on who you're going to ask and whether or not they have kids and, and, and really down to their school district. I, and this is something my wife and I continually ask ourselves every single year is what we've, the path we've chosen for our kids, uh, the current path we're on, is it the, the right one? Because there's a lot of options out there. And um, we happen to be in a very small town where we know a lot of the teachers and the school system and, uh, and the principal really well. Um, if you were to ask me, I guess, on, on a large scale, what is the state of the school system? I'd say uh, it's suffering in a lot of ways. Um, you know, kids are going to school and they're learning. Um, and our kids aren't necessarily... Uh, you know, an exception to all of this, but they're learning rote answers. And so they're memorizing and, and having to, uh, you know, to do that on tests. And, you know, I'd say our school, when you look at it a little bit deeper is, uh, is, has been for a long time trying to move past that and get more interactive. And, uh, you know, and they have after school things that uh, kids can get involved in where they can get hands on with some stuff, which is what I really enjoy. But when you look at sort of the 
um, sort of the, uh, the general, you know, what is the average student getting? Um, I'd say that probably not exactly what they're needing. Well, you're not the only person that ever says that when we ask that question. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your family and uh, how many kids you have in school. And uh, uh, just give us a picture of that. Yeah, uh, my wife and I have three girls. Uh, they are in first, third, and fourth grade right now. And so we live in a uh, what most people would deem a tiny town. We've come to consider it normal, uh, but way up in the mountains of Colorado in a town of 7,500 people. Uh, and we live about a block from the school. And so we walk there. And, uh, and even if it's raining or snowing, uh, we're, out, we're out walking the school. And so it's probably much more of a unique situation than a lot of, uh, I guess, your average Americans would find themselves. So thinking about your own kids, uh, this is the internet age, and we can go to Wikipedia or Google or uh, Bing, and we can type in a question, and it will spit back some sort of an answer, uh, which will make us look pretty smart if we were able to just spit that same answer back out. So in that kind of an environment, what do you think it means to be educated? You know, as, as far as the school systems would, uh, would would deem that, I think they would say, you know, if you're passing your tests, which is what you've memorized um, the answers to, um, I think that is your that's your standard education. And so you have to uh, because you compare a student to this other student, whether they're in the same class or different schools or maybe even different states uh, of the United States in particular. It's it's really and, and and I'll even back up one a couple levels deeper I guess from this is uh, that my wife and I moved across the country a number of years ago and one of the things we were looking at in particular was school systems and the one thing that we learned is that you can't compare this school system in Wisconsin to this school system in North Carolina and you can't compare either of those two to the a school system in Colorado. Um, because if you look at uh, test wise, uh, I should s throw that out. Um, when you look at test scores and things like that, they can be all over the board. And so if your test score is this over here, but this over here, uh, the standards and the tests are actually different. And so um, I think that's a, a lot how, how school boards and whatnot uh, deem kids to be educated. Uh, in my eyes, however, I think in education and even in the role that I'm doing uh, and a lot of the roles that I've had, uh, as you read earlier uh, through my bio, we started the show, um, pretty much everything in there uh, is, is nothing I've ever studied, nothing I've gone to school for, with the exception of aviation. There was a, a, te a technology degree with an emphasis in aviation and became a, a commercial airline pilot and promptly left after about seven years. And it's been, I've had a longer um, working career outside of the thing I majored in studied in school than I have uh, actually using that in the real world. So educated to me, feels an awful lot like getting real hands-on experience doing stuff out in the real world and that's an education and so I think for the most part you know there's um, there's professions like doctors and, and attorneys perhaps where you need that education you need to get that license in order to practice uh, that craft that you studied uh, but there's a lot of things out there and I'd say the vast majority by far uh, are things that you don't need an education for um, things that you can just go out and, and get a basic understanding in some books and then maybe take some classes or go to some meetups and hang out with people and, and maybe get a little bit of coaching in uh, and then read some more books and, and really just start dipping your toes into the water and just and learning on nights and weekends and in your free time um, and then get to the point where somebody will teach you more, take you on and do an apprenticeship and and. It's it's in my eyes just it's it's a far different form of education, but education to me, no matter how you do it, comes to real world, hands on experience. I think I could agree with that. Um, so how do you get that? I mean, you mentioned some different ways that you might get that experience, and you know quite a few people that have gone these alternative routes. What are some of the most common things that people do uh, to get educated, other than the 
sort of mainstream standard for your colleges, you know, K-12 uh, schools, et cetera? Sure, yeah, you know, and outside the schools, and I can speak pretty clearly to, to this because it's it's the path that, that I've chosen. I mean, I went to a four-year uh, college and got the degree, and so I have an associate's and a bachelor's, and, um, and I still do. I don't want to give the impression that I don't use um, that education. I think that education in a lot of instances can be very valuable uh, if you take things that interest you and apply uh, you apply yourself to that learning. There's things that I learned that I learned then that I still continue to use today. Um, but that path for me was going out. And, and initially when I started a business, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, and so I had read a million books about starting businesses, about marketing. I had no business background. Um, I didn't know anybody else who was self-employed or even tried to do a business. Um, I shoveled some driveways when I was a kid, but that was about it. So, so I did a lot of that self-education, and, and I got to a point where I had answered a lot of the questions and prepared myself to then go and, and pay. I think I paid almost $5,000 to do an in-person, uh, and this was in Tennessee, uh, with a group of, I think there were probably 50 of us who were accepted to a program to go through and, and study, uh, not like a university setting, but actually this is actual real world where there's you know some lectures. And this was, a, I wanna say it was a four day program. So there's a lot of lectures and learning and, and even book reading and things at night back in a hotel. But then there were, were real world role plays. And so how do you do this? And all right, put yourself in this situation. And, and man, it, it felt really just awkward and cheesy. And yeah, I don't wanna do this. Just give me the knowledge so I can sit here and ask some questions and then leave. But man, when I got back and, and first sat down and started doing that, that's one of the things that instantly connected with me was that real world hands-on training was the best thing by far that came out of that $5,000 and four-day course. And so it's, it's any way you can get um, that hands-on experience. And in fact, I'm, uh, I, to a point, I got uh, a little frustrated with some of the types of clients that I was working with that, you know, we'd build plans together and then they wouldn't actually do them. And it, far beyond making, making money and being self-employed, I actually wanted to see results. And so now I've been working a lot closer with larger businesses and actually doing the roles where I was consulting before. And uh, one of my one of my newest roles in building software is working with the development team. And I sort of have have a background, self-taught background in, in web development and things like HTML and CSS and a little JavaScript and uh, and some of the operation stuff as it, as it relates. Um, but I don't have any experience in this role. And it was a new role for the company that I was working with. And so now we're looking at, gosh, how can I accelerate my training? And I don't care about going and getting a four-year or even a two-year degree in this. What I'm looking for, and in fact, before we jumped on our call here uh, today, was looking at not necessarily certifications, but where can I go and just dive deep into this role so I can be as good as I possibly can be with the knowledge that I have? How can I get more? And so, you know, there's some of those are certification classes. Some of them are just long one day intensive type trainings. And so I'm looking and studying that. And, you know, it, it's some of you read the books and some books are free and some books are 10 bucks or in my case, I've been reading college books. Um, so some of those, it's the same type of book, but they'll charge you $35 for it. Um, and, and then you can get into some of these classes and attend free meetups and some of the things that I'm looking at for two days uh, to go through a, a real intensive thing is about $1,200. And uh, to me, to have that hands-on, getting in and learning all of that stuff in that sort of setting is what I really thrive off of. So listening to all of that, it occurs to me that uh, you spend a lot of time pushing into the content in some sort of a practical way, but that you also spend time reading in the theory, maybe going to classes, getting some trainings. What percentage of effort do you think goes into the theory and what percentage of effort do you think goes into the practice for learning that? Oh, I'd say the, you know, the majority because, and I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where 
um, you know, I'm actually doing the work. Uh, so it's hands on learning. And so that's basically all day, every day learning as I go. Um, but also sprinkled throughout the day is reading articles uh, and different blog posts. And at night, I'm a voracious reader. And so uh, I read every single night uh, and a lot of mornings as well. And so I'm going through those textbooks, as I mentioned. So, um, you know, I, I would say that a lot of the books and, and, and knowledge gained through that sort of experience probably fall into uh, the theoretical uh, parts of it versus the hands-on actually doing it. Um, but in what I'm actually going through right now, it's interesting because I can read about, oh, we have, and we, so when in software development, there's systems and things that we have set in place. And so we're following, uh, we're following a process called agile uh, software development or project management. And so there's specific meetings and things that you lead teams through. And so I can go in and, and learn about what's the ide most ideal way to lead the meeting that I'm having tomorrow, the same one that we do every two weeks. And I can uh, read different takes and opinions on that the day before and then go into a meeting with a fresh perspective on it. So it's getting that theory, but then almost instantly being able to apply it is uh, is extremely beneficial. All right. So... I don't know if you're quantitative or not. So in my mind, I'm sitting here trying to do a calculation. That, well, is that like 50%? Is that like 80% application? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 probably at least 80% application. Well, we could we could take off down that trail. I think I'm going to leave that rabbit trail alone. How about we uh, get to the heart of what we ask in this podcast? The our favorite question, the one we're always waiting for someone to answer, is what is the purpose of an education? Uh, in my eyes, which is probably the only way I can answer that, the purpose of an education is to be more knowledgeable um, in something that you're interested in. Uh, and then uh, because at some point you want to apply that knowledge to a particular task, um, you know, if I uh, and we'll kind of take this out of the work setting, even, you know, if I want to. Um, I, I haul a lot of firewood, so and we're kind of in that season here in the fall as we talk. And so um, on weekends, I've been hauling a lot of firewood. And and when I started doing that many years ago, you know, past helping my dad as I was growing up, you know, it was, well, how do I, you know, anybody can, you know, if somebody shows you how to start a chainsaw, that's great. But it's the education piece, like, how do I do this and how can I be most effective at doing that so that I can apply it? Not so I can just learn the theory, but what is it? How can I use this? And now there are some people, which is really interesting, that just want to know theories. And I, I put some people like uh, possibly history uh, majors in this. They just want to know and gain knowledge. And, and I think it's really interesting because there's a lot of, uh, there's definitely a lot of knowledge to be gained, but there's a lot of things that are interesting about that. Um, but for somebody like me, I'm not necessarily going to apply that. You know, there's things that we can learn from history, but I don't study it so that I can change the way that I live my life today on a lot of aspects. You know, I'm learning the, uh, I'm not really a history buff, but I enjoy it. And so um, I'm learning about the, the history of uh, of Mongolia and the Khans and, and Genghis Khan and uh, and that sort of thing right now. I'm not necessarily going to apply that. So when we look at education as far as why am I learning this, it's in my eyes, it's so that I can apply it so that I can uh, so that I can do the thing that I'm interested, whether that's work or somehow improve my life or, you know, maybe I'm going to go through and um, and learn how to to be a woodworker and so I can work with wood and, and build a, a bench uh, for, you know, for outside to sit on the deck. Uh, or maybe I'm going to learn about electricity because I want to rewire my house, you know. And so I think there's a lot of this uh, this application. But I think that's really what education comes down to is we're not learning just to fill our heads with knowledge. We're learning because we want to ultimately do something. So I always get lots of different answers to that question, and I, there, I don't think there's a wrong answer to that question. I think what the purpose of an education is depends on the person you ask. But we always try to follow that up with the, with the next question is, so if 
the purpose in a, of an education is to prepare you in some uh, meaningful way uh, for the things that you want to do. If we pull that back into the school system, so I'm going to ask you to turn your hat back around here. How do you think we can implement uh, that purpose in a meaningful way? Oh, and that's that's an easy uh, answer for me, and that's to have uh, things that are very hands-on. And so that go beyond the theoretical, um, you know, just memorize this sort of thing to understanding why that is the way that it is. Um, parts of geometry to me, if I think back to high school even, are, are, are sort of like that. You know, there's a lot of theories and proofs that you have to do, but then there's this whole other side of, and I'm not interested in that at all, just the way my mind works. There's a, there's a whole other uh, side to geometry where you can go in and actually be very hands-on and play with that stuff, and it goes beyond the theory. And so, and I, I think that's the way that uh, that students should be learning, that anybody should be learning, and that student or that school should be teaching, is I, I think there's, a, as I mentioned before, a, a real, very real benefit to the theory, uh, but there's an even stronger benefit to the hands-on, real world. How can I, how can I build things and understand the world around me? Because that's how that's how we learn when we're babies. We we have to be hands-on. And, you know, babies put things in their mouths, and, and that's a, a big sensory part of how they take in this input. Uh, and so it's, uh, to me, with schools, I believe that they should be doing more of what I mentioned earlier, and, and our school has these after-school programs where, um, you know, we have volunteers in, in that extent that come in and, and do things with Legos and, and run computer programs and that sort of thing. It's, and it's, it's learning and putting pieces together and connecting. Uh, it's connecting art to math. And in a way that, you know, kids never thought they went together before, but they most certainly go together. Um, and, and so it's those hands on things that I think are extremely valuable and should be emphasized more in schools. So thank you, Justin, for giving us some views on uh, uh, education. And why don't you tell us how to get in touch with you and we'll uh, wrap this up. Um, people can reach me through coachradio.tv. I hang out there, and you'll find links to all of, me, uh, all of my uh, social media stuff. If you want to uh, go over there and connect, I'd be happy to. Excellent. Thank you, Justin. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.